you know, if, if I could draw, I mean, really draw, you know, I spent most of my childhood drawing and I almost went to art school after high school, but I didn't. Um, if I could really draw, I don't think I'd ever want to do anything but comics. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, what a, if you can write and draw, what other medium would you want to work in? If you can do both those things, you can express yourself in ways that no other medium would allow you to express yourself. Welcome everyone back to the Comics Cube. I am back with J.M. DiMatteis. Did I do that right? You did it right. You did it okay. right. That's great. Uh, how are you? I'm, I'm very good, all things considered. I always say all things considered, considering the state of the world, but we're doing mm. fine here. <laughs> yeah, comparatively <laughs> speaking. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I'm going to start off with the single most clickbaity question I can think of, which is... Oh, God. Mm -hmm. um, which is... You're given the choice by Hollywood to pick one of the three live action Spider-Man to do the clone saga, which means that this person has to do Ben Riley. Which actor would you pick? Which Spider-Man live action actor would you pick? It's for the clone saga? Yeah. If you could pick one of the three of them to do the clone saga. Uh, Tobey Maguire. Really? Yeah. He's, still, he's still my favorite out of the three. Yeah. Did yeah. you did you watch No Way Home and enjoy it? I have not seen it yet. I've heard only great things about it, but I have not seen it yet. If it had been up to you, how would the Clone Saga have ended? It would well it would have ended the way we originally planned it, which was when we first got into it. It was going to last about six months, and then maybe at most a year. And the idea was, Peter. Peter would find out that he was the clone. That Ben, who had come back, was actually the real Spider Man. Peter and MJ would go off and have their baby and live happily ever after. And then he would always be there to come back into the books. And we sat down and we planned out a complete reboot. We we're going to reboot all the books with Ben as Spider-Man, starting with number ones, new supporting cast, new villains. We were going to make it a whole new fresh start. And that's, that was the plan from the beginning. The, uh, was there ever pressure from on high knowing, uh, you know, to, to have a backup plan to bring Peter back or? Oh, I think, you know, Tom DeFalco, who was editor in chief at the time had in the back of his head. And I think, and he and Danny Fingerworth, our editor had a backup plan just in case. Sure. Cause it's comics. You know, the truth is uh, that w maybe they would have undone it in it, 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 it had they not, had it, not, not them, but had the powers that be not really screwed around with the story for so long, maybe five years later, they would have switched it back, you know? Um, but our plan was to take it very seriously that Ben was, was the real Peter and reboot from there. And I think had we done it in a reasonable amount of time within six months or at most a year uh, and really relaunched all the books, it would have been wildly successful. And Peter would still be there. Peter and Mary Jane, they didn't disappear into a black hole. Peter could have come back at any time, once a year, twice a year, they could have teamed up. We could have, we could have had a whole mini series about Peter's life in Portland. You could have done a million different things. So um, I think it would have been it would have been very audacious and really cool. That was a really promising setup. Uh, but yeah. and if it had been up to you, like what would how would the whole storyline with Judas Traveler and Scryer would have been? Because I feel like you had the most investment in them. But, you know. I did. And I tell you, I don't remember what the, what the plan was, you know. But yeah, Judas, Judas, Judas Traveler, especially. And then Scryer. What I did later on was I, I created another Scryer when I was writing Silver Surfer. Mm -hmm. who was much more of a cosmic entity who had been the inspiration for the other sp scryer, you know? Um, but uh, I don't remember what, what, what the plan was for Judas Traveler down the line, but I think the, you know, the basic plan was let's, let's, he can be a recurring villain and someone who can become part of the rogues gallery and come back. But then, you know, the thing got dragged on for a variety of reasons for years, literally for years, I, I put on my parachute and jumped out about halfway through, you know? Yeah. Um, and then when they were done with that, basically they came in with a broom and swept it all away as if it never happened. And the nice thing has been that over the years, it's all, not all of it, but all the important elements from Ben to Kane to this and that, they all come back, you know? So here I find myself all these years later writing a Ben Riley miniseries. Yes. And, and having a fantastic time. I love that character. He's a great character. It's such a it's such a great setup for you because you jumped uh, right as he was going to become Spider Man, right? Yeah, and, yeah, that's true. And now here you are writing him as he is Spider Man, like back then. Uh, 
Yeah. I always felt like that was a, that was a missed opportunity to, to not have kept you on the book because that new status quo was perfect for you to do. Right. Well, that everything. was, my, that was my choice. That was my choice to leave at that point, you know, so, you know, but, but it's fun. What's great about this story is it's like literally at that exact moment, you know what I mean? It's not like he hasn't been Spider-Man for a little while. This is him at the moment when Peter has just left and he's just stepping into these shoes again and, or boots as the case may be. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and he's a guy who really isn't sure of who he is, you know, um, he, he, he's found out that he, you know, he spent five years running around thinking he's a clone. And now he comes back and he discovers, no, those memories are real. And this is who I am, but he's, cre you know, he's been Ben Riley for five years, which, you know, never felt like a real identity. He traveled the whole world, you know, basically looking to find something to make a life and he couldn't, and now he's back. And he, he's comfortable being Spider-Man. That's the easy part. But who is Ben Riley is the question that drives this series. Uh, one of the scenes that I liked uh, in the first issue that where David Baldion is uh, drawing it is um, the, the confrontation between Ben Riley and J. Jonah Jameson. Because I always, like, that was always a, a small thing for me back then was like, what if somebody sees him? Like blonde hair isn't yeah, going to hide it. I, that's exactly what I've always thought. You know, if tomorrow you were a blonde, um, I think that your loved ones and friends would recognize you and they'd go, <laughs> why did you dye your hair blonde? That would be the only reaction. They wouldn't walk by you on the street and assume you were somebody else. So the point of that scene for me was it's more to it than just the hair. It's a quality of being. It's who he is. And he is not Peter. And it's a great moment when Jonah is, you know, after like blathering Jonah style for a while, realizes, oh, wait a minute. First, there's a close up of Ben. He goes, I'm not who you think I am. And Jonah realizes it. And he gets completely flustered um, and then, then, you know, walks away. And I wanted to really underscore that it's more than the hair, because I always thought the hair thing was like, yeah, same thing. It's like, that's not going to fool anybody if you just change your hair, you know? Um, so that's one of my favorite scenes in the book and David just delivered it perfectly. Yeah. It's like that Clark Kent thing. It's like, it's not enough yes. that he puts on glasses. He's got to act like a completely different person. Right. Kind of what exactly what Christopher Reeve did so brilliantly in those movies. You know, we, you really believe that, you know, a pair of glasses and a change of posture and a change of voice, you know? Um, and there, like I said, there's a quality of being and, and Ben, Ben is, a, you know, it's just, he's just a different, he's Peter, but he's not Peter. So there's a whole other quality of being there and a, and, and a, and a shade of darkness there that isn't in Peter. Yeah. And we talked about it last time, which is that uh, he has better survival instincts. So he's a little less prone to that whole self-pity guilt thing that Peter, that Peter right. is. Right. Right. And when we, we address that in the series where he talks about the whole guilt issue, what comes up later on, um, we address that directly. I want to get back to that in a little bit, but um, I want to ask you, I know you left, uh, you, have, you made the choice to leave, uh, and so did Danny Fingeroth at around that time. Did you guys mm -hmm. talk about that? Did you make the... the no, the, those two things were not related. In fact, uh, Danny left and then Bob Budiansky came in and I was around for a while after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, you know, those were different things, different issues. Uh, I think Danny at that point got another job that was uh, very yeah. enticing, as I recall. Um, did you at the time i know that there was a lot of backlash did, did you did you get the did you see the letters from the fans was it you know when i was working on those books there was not a lot of backlash in fact those books were selling really really well and they were successful that's one of the reasons why the story went on so long you know this was a time when all of comics were taking a hit and yeah. sales you know after the big boom were starting to go down and Spider-Man sales were doing pretty well in that market at that time. And in fact, I think that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the reasons why marketing wanted the story dragged out more because the, the storyline was doing really, really well. Yeah. I think the backlash came as a result of it being dragged on and on and on and on and on, you know? Did, uh, I once read that the plan, had it not been dragged out, was that Aunt May wasn't going to die in number 400. Was that true? Or No, no, that, uh, I never, no. That's okay. something someone made up. Because that's like the best issue ever for, for, <laughs> Thank you. for that Thank entire clone no. song. Yeah, um, no, I think, you know, someone was asking me about this and there was at one point early on where we even thought the whole thing would be over by issue 400, you know? Yeah. Um, but that, that clearly didn't happen. Um, no, the Aunt May death was something that, that was sort of pointing us in this new direction that I'm talking about toward the reboot and everything. And we said, you know, what can we do to, ch to shake things up to let people know that, that we're really 
this is for real and we're changing things. And so, you know, we, we talked about the death of Aunt May, we agreed on it. And then I went off and wrote it. It's one of my favorite, favorite stories out of all the Spider-Man work I've done. Yeah. I will Thanks get no small parts of Mark Bagley who did such a beautiful job with it. Yeah. I will get back to that too. At some, uh, later. Uh, but, uh, one of the things that I am in, uh, fascinated by is I know that as the, as every day goes by, you're not really aware of how much something changed from the previous day. So like, we're mm -hmm. only aware of changes as, as a lot of time goes by. And I think, that it's a perfect opportunity to ask you like how the character has changed, how the, in, how the company Marvel has changed, how the industry has changed now that you're working on Ben Riley now versus working on Ben Riley 25 years ago. That's interesting. Someone asked me the same question recently. And the first thing I'll say is the company's always changing. Marvel's, you know, the comp all the companies are always changing. Certainly Marvel and DC who I've worked for for so many years, you know, um, uh, you know, you grow up reading, say, Mar I'll use Marvel as an example, but it applies to DC as well. I'm not singling out Marvel. So you grow up and you're reading one version of Marvel and you create in your head an image of what that company is. And for me growing up, at first it was like Stan and Jack and Steve. And then it was, you know, all those great guys in the 70s, you know, um, and, and then you get there and it's a completely different company. Yeah, I got there during the shooter era, you know, and then as I continued to work, you know, it changes editor in chiefs. It changes. Um, ownership it changes this it changes that and and what you realize what i realized very early on was uh how do i phrase this delicately the company doesn't matter <laughs> what matters no truly what matters because the company will change you know the company that it is on monday it might not be on wednesday and i've seen it in my career over and over again and uh, and i'm and i'm saying monday and wednesday just to compress a concept you know on monday the phone is ringing off the hook and, and you have so much work, you don't know what you're going to do with it. You have to turn down work. And on Wednesday, there's a new editor in chief or they sold the company to somebody else and they have to have whatever it is. And suddenly there's no work. The company changes. You can't trust a company because the company is a machine that goes on and on and on and on. You can have, have great affection for Marvel and DC because they have entertained me my entire life and provided me with my living. But what, what, I'm, what I'm connected to, what I'm attached to, are the people that I work with. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can't identify with a company. I'm a Marvel guy. I'm a DC guy. No, I enjoy the people that I work with. I love these characters. But in terms of the company, that just keeps changing. And the company that loves you on Monday will literally pick, well, not literally, will metaphorically pick you up and throw you out the window on Wednesday and watch you splatter to the sidewalk. And then six months later, we'll wave at you. Come on back up. You know what I mean? It's like, and there's very little rhyme or reason to it. So I learned early on not to be loyal to a company, but to be loyal to the people that I work with. And, you know, I've, you know, having done this for so long, I have a lot of people in this business that are good friends. And I feel like it's, it's, it's been a real blessing uh, just knowing the people that I know working in this business for so long. How has comic book story, storytelling changed? <sighs> You know, it changes and it doesn't change. Uh, you know, the outer, the outer, the outer husk of it may change. You know, this style of artwork may come in. Oh, we're decompressed now, so we spread things out a little bit more. Oh, we don't want to do word balloons. We're just going to do captions. You know, these kind of trends that come and go. Some of which are great, some of which are not. Some of which start out great, and then other people start imitating them, and it, they become awful because of the imitation. But underneath that is story. You know, and story is story. And telling a story in 1982 is the same as telling a story is in 2022, you know? Um, and for me, you know, it's about, it's about the characters. As long as you're telling a story that gets into the characters' hearts and minds and lets that lead you, then you're telling a good story. Someone else may have another definition of what a good story is and they're, you know, and that's fine too. But for me, that's what it is. And that has never changed. I feel like, you were always kind of ahead of your time because you were always because like we mentioned last time, you were one of the first people to use first person captions, first person narration. And I feel like uh, reading 80s comics where some people who weren't used to first person narration all of a sudden had to use it like you, you could kind of feel like there was maybe a little bit of a struggle to do that. But since you were already doing that, that has never been an, that, that was never been an issue for you. It just always felt yeah, like one of I, your I, trademarks. Yeah, I don't know if I was the first person to do it. I doubt that. But uh, I was always very comfortable with first person narration because it's a direct line into somebody's head. And yeah. there's, a, there's a different feeling between, and, and it's, it's, 
it's something I couldn't even put into words. The difference between a thought balloon, which I, I think thought balloons are a very valuable tool that we have lost, and um, and a first person narration. Because even though the first per there's something, I can't explain it, but there's a different quality and a different feeling when it's in a caption and when it's in a balloon. It becomes somehow a little more, even though you're in that character's voice, maybe a little more literary, but when it goes into that box, maybe the, the thought balloon is a little more natural, uh, becomes a little more heightened in the caption. I never really thought about this, so I'm, I'm grasping yeah. here. But there is a difference between the feeling of a thought balloon and the feeling of the caption, and it's really subtle. It's like a difference, the, the, the width of a hair, you know? But there's a difference and it creates, also just, you know, the funny thing with comics is it's, it's we're taking the whole thing in visually. So yeah. even looking at a page, your brain is perceiving a word balloon differently than your brain is perceiving a caption. Yeah. And is just it, as, as people go, go is ahead. it the immediacy? Because like, a, 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 you know, a, a caption could be somebody telling a story from the past. It could be somebody's innermost thoughts or something, but right. a thought balloon right. is like what you're thinking. Thought, exactly balloon is, at that moment. Oh, thought balloon is always immediate. The caption could even be 30 seconds later. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or it could be 30 years later. But you know, even if it's a first person in the moment thing, there's a little, there's just a little hair of a remove in a first person caption. Whereas, whereas just what you're saying, a, 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 a thought balloon, you can't, that's in that exact second it's happening, you know? I think, uh, you, you think the thought balloon still has some use? Yeah, for... I don't see why not. It's like, you know, I remember a few years back, I was working on something at DC and I thought, I miss thought balloons. I'm gonna put some in. The editor immediately took them out and made them all captions. It's like, oh no, that looks too much like a comic book. We can't have a thought balloon. We can still say bam and slam and wham, but we can't have a thought balloon, you know, <laughs> because it's too juvenile. I don't know what the thinking is. You know, I think you should be able to use any tool at your disposal, really. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I, I see no, no issue with it, but, but okay. Um, would so with this current uh, Ben Riley series that you're doing, yeah, uh, you are you know you brought back in uh, Carrion, Doctor Kafka, uh, and Vermin. Uh, well, Edward Wheeler. Yeah. Uh, what attracts you to those characters? Obviously, uh, you created Vermin and Doctor and, and Doctor and Dr. Kafka. Yeah, yeah. So it's nice to revisit these characters. Um, and the other thing is, well, it takes place in that time period, and Carrion was one of those characters from that time period. And uh, and I remember I did a, a, a pretty big Carrion centric story when I took over Amazing Spider Man. So it was a character that I knew with and Shriek. I liked his with Shriek. That's right. Yeah. I liked the psychology of that character, and that disappearance in the first issue really gets into that struggle inside him and Ben's solution to that. Um, so, you know, part of it is just, this is what's going on then. So I'm going to pull those characters out and we will see, we'll see more of them as we go along. Do you have any particular characters that you have an affinity for, uh, for that time, for that time period? Uh, you know, or... it's a fun, it's a funny thing. I probably do, you know, you know, Kafka and Vermin for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, I, I love Kane. I think Kane is a phenomenal character. I don't know what Kane's current status quo is live dead. A melted puddle somewhere i don't know i um, think he's alive i okay. want to say he's alive yeah kane is a great character and then the other thing is that you never know until you write a character really like we talk about that that carrion uh and shriek storyline shriek was a character that uh came up when we were doing maximum carnage i think yeah and we knew we needed uh, i think i think we, we a bunch of us were discussing this recently because sometimes no one remembers who created what and what we finally figured out was we needed a, a strong female villain and, and we sent Tom DeValco home to come up with somebody and he came up with Shriek. Uh, and, you know, she had been established, but not, we hadn't yet really delved into her. So I thought, well, here's a brand new character. And so we did this four or five part story called Shrieking where we really got to dig into her head. And then as you write the character, you fall in love with the character. Same thing with Carrion. I had never written Carrion, wasn't really sure. And then I thought, okay, let's see who this is and you find a connection to the character. So it's, it's you know, every once in a while there may be a character and I can't think of any offhand that you start to write and you just can't connect with. Um, but for the most part, if you're doing your job right, you can always find something. And then suddenly that character becomes a favorite character. Even I've, had, I've written characters, you know, sometimes you, as a reader, you go, oh, I don't really like that character. Or I don't even wanna read that book. And then you find yourself in a situation where you have to write them. It's happened with some of the animated movies as well. And they say, hey, we're doing a movie with X. Um, 
Well, I got it. I'm sitting on the phone going, I, I really don't like that character. But then you read through the material, you know, you find the door into their psyche and suddenly you connect to them the same way you would connect to another person. And that's our job. We have to do that. Yeah, that's uh, and with that. Uh, so I have to ask for for the remainder of this miniseries, uh, what else can we expect for Ben for our friend Ben Riley? I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> It's, have you, you seen know, yeah okay what no thematically it's really about what i just started saying it's like okay. it, it's it's the primal question which drives a lot of my stories which is well who am i all right i'm back i have i've been given my life back and yet i haven't because he can't go back to his old friends he can't go back to his old job he can't be peter parker he's ben riley who is essentially nobody you know here's this brilliant guy he's working in a coffee shop he's serving coffee and washing cups in the back you know um how do I build a life? And he's walled himself off. So he doesn't even think he, 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 he's capable of friendships. So it, it's, it's Ben's journey to figure out who he is in this space and time and, and, and how can he break out of these walls that he's put around himself and make connection to other people. The name of the story is the humanity agenda. And it works on a lot of different levels. It works for our ultimate villain who will not be revealed for a few issues and it also works for ben because it's him seeking his humanity i'm going to ask a question that um is kind of hotly debated on social media i notice uh and i feel like you're uniquely suited to answer this question okay. is we'll is i have an answer <laughs> is peter parker jewish jewish coded is peter that's, that's interesting you know um here's the thing i think if you talk like you know, I, I come from a mixed background. My father was Italian Catholic. My mother was Jewish, you know, so I can relate to Peter's guilt from both sides. From both you know? sides. That's why I said you're but uniquely Aunt, suited. <laughs> you know, Aunt May always struck me as a classic Jewish mother, even though they say she's Catholic and whatever else, you know. And, I, and Peter Parker seems uh, archetypally Jewish in a lot of ways. But talk to Tom DeFalco, who grew up an Italian Catholic boy, and he, really, he relates to Peter and Aunt May from that perspective. And that's the great thing about Peter is you can put a lot of lenses on him and they all kind of work, you know, um, uh, especially if you grew up in a culture where, you know, you have, uh, you know, loving and overprotective mothers, you know what I mean? Who, which, which are, you know, which goes across cultures. So it could be almost anything, you know? Um, so, you know, but it, I think when you think of Peter's, you know, guilt and, and his neurotic qualities, you know, it, it fits uh, Jewishness, it fits, Catholics, and I'm sure it fits lots of other things as well. But I think Peter is sort of a universal uh, symbol. We, we all project our own guilt and neuroses and all these things onto Peter. And he, and he carries it for all of us in some ways. Yeah, because I asked uh, Danny Finger about that question. He said, as somebody who has edited comics where he's gone to church, yes, I think he's Jewish. So, right. I'm right. Like, and, and Danny's looking at it through the filter of his own Jewishness, you know? Yes. And, and like I said, I can see it. I can see it. Uh, in, in multiple ways, but I think my first instinct would be that, yeah, of course, you know, they probably changed their name from, you know, Schwartz to Parker at some point. <laughs> um, and that is interesting to me because it's been a while since I read Brook Brooklyn Dreams. But what I do remember mm -hmm. is that is that uh, dichotomy of uh, being Italian Catholic and, and and Jewish at the same time. Right. Uh, right how how right. much of and Brooklyn Dreams? Where those... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, how much of Brooklyn Dreams is real? Is you? All of it. <laughs> Here's the thing. The reason that I changed the names, you know, they changed the names to protect the innocent um, on that level. There's that level. But I also changed the names because I wanted to get to the essence of my of my growing up and coming of age. I didn't have to. I didn't want to worry that if oh, if I said this and it happened on Tuesday at three o'clock, and I said it happened on Monday at four o'clock, and I'm I'm just picking that as a ridiculous example. Um, I don't want to have to be bound by the facts. I wanted to get to the truth. So by quote fictionalizing it, I was able to be free and write it exactly the way I wanted, and not like worry that this isn't a hundred percent accurate. But the joke is in the end. It's pretty accurate, you know. I mean, I was writing from my own memories and my own life. The story and everything that matters in it is true. It yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, were you supposed to be Mark John instead of John Mark? Uh, it's the other way around. Uh, that that um, I was told when I was a kid that my name was Mark John, 
but my, my birth certificate said John Mark. Oh. And so my father wanted my name to be John. My mother wanted my name to be Mark. There was a big battle over that. And he got to the, to the records people first and it was John Mark and she did not like that. So till I was like in the fifth or sixth grade, that I thought my first name was Mark and my middle name was John. And finally, my father couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and he literally came up to school in the middle of the day and brought me to the office. And they said, had all my records changed. So it said John Mark. And it's like, talk about an identity. No wonder I write about people with identity crisis. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you do go so, by Mark, well, right? Like, uh, more yeah, often. Yeah. You know, uh, I go by JM. I go by Mark. The only people that call me John usually are... Uh, I know it's a phone solicitor or the government calling, you know? <laughs> so your mom won. She, she did basically. Well, you know, but my dad went to, with the, that's how I ended up with JM. I thought I've got both these names, you know, I work for JM Barry and JD Salinger and all these writers, you know? So I'll, I'll go with initials that will solve the problem. How, uh, how is your relationship like with, 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 with God, you know, cause, cause that's an interesting thing about the book. Oh, gee, let's, let's not get yeah. heavy at all. Shall we? Yeah. How is my relationship? Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to talk about these things because it's deeply personal, but my, you know, my spiritual, I'm not religious, you know, and, and part of that was growing up going, Oh, this is, these are Jews over here. These are Catholics over here, you know? And I, my, my, uh, my connection, if anything, is more to like the East and Hinduism and things like that, but I am not a Hindu. Some website has me down as a Hindu. I am not. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I just have a, a deep spiritual connection and it's really kind of the central hub around which my, my, my life turns is my connection to God. And, and for me, it's, it's through a particular spiritual master named uh, Meher Baba. Uh, that I've, it's been part of my life since I'm 19 years old, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, but it's, it's not, it's not through any traditional lens, you know, it's yeah. very personal, uh, but it's the, it's really the, it's, it's the ground on which I walk, you know. How would you say that informs the writing of corporate characters? Would, well, would, you know, whatever you write, yeah. Whatever we're writing, I always say this, and we might have talked about this last time, anything you write, I don't care what you're writing. If you're, if you're Edgar Rice Burroughs writing John Carter of Mars, it's autobiographical. Uh, everything we write is filtered through our own interests and obsessions. You know, and I've written plenty of mainstream comic book stories. And what are they all about? They're about the search for personal identities, for psychological truth and cosmic truth. You know, yeah. it's the spiritual quest, the, the psychological quest. Those are the things that drive me as a person. And those are the things that tend to drive the characters in my stories. That's interesting. And it doesn't matter whether it's a creator owned book on some level or, a, you know, I've said before that I put things into Spider-Man stories that were deeply personal right out of my life, you know, and put it into Peter and Mary Jane's mouths or whatever. Oh, it's me and my wife talking to each other, you know, whatever it is. And, and in some cases, though, you know, I, I, I did two years of Dr. Fate at DC back yeah. in the early 90s, I think it was late 80s, early 90s. And that was a time, that, that, that period, there was so much freedom in mainstream comics, it was unbelievable. So two years on that book was no different than two years doing a creator-owned book, really, except, of course, for the fact that they owned it. <laughs> but in terms of the freedom that I had to pursue all my obsessions in the pages of a comic book, you know, I might as well have been working on a creator-owned book. And it was about all my spiritual obsessions. And that, that, one of the reasons I really enjoyed that book was because it did it it was a superhero book it was a spiritual book it was a psychological book it was a comedy book it was all it was like everything that i was thinking and feeling at the time went into that and those are the, those are the projects that you love the most because you get to express the fullness of what you're thinking and feeling at any given moment through these characters and through these stories and also uh the same thing with brooklyn dreams and 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 uh with with parents from different backgrounds uh, that is even more evident in something like Moonshadow. It's, it's a theme that you keep that you that you come yes. back to, right? Yes, he really has a mixed background because his father is an alien ball of light, and you know. And the truth of the matter is, I didn't you know didn't really realize till after the fact that even though it's it's put in fantastical terms, Moonshadow is as autobiograph autobiographical as Brooklyn Dreams. They're mirror stories of each other. They are the same story told in very different ways, you know. And yeah. and and him working on his relationship with his ball of light father, you know, and, and then the character in Brooklyn Dreams dealing with his father. It's the same thing expressed in different ways. And how does it feel knowing that Moonshadow was a game changer back? You know, it was a game changer for me 
as a writer. Yeah. You know, it really was. It, 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 I'd been at Marvel for a couple of years, you know, I, I, and I started out at DC learning, starting to learn my craft there, went to Marvel and started to expand out a little bit. But, and it, this was me, this was not the company doing this to me. You know, like I, you're writing Marvel comics and there was a part of my brain, no matter how much I was trying to do stories that mattered to me, that, that created, this is how you write a, a Marvel, this is a superhero Marvel comic and you write it a certain way and you do a certain thing. And by stepping out of that, and working on something that was purely mine and working with an artist as brilliant as John J. Muth, it just liberated me. I, I didn't write that like it was a comic book. I wrote that like as if I were writing a novel or anything. I was just writing and it freed me as a writer so that when I was stepped back into that world and I think the next big Marvel project I did after that was probably Craven's Last Hunt. Yeah. My, my writer's brain had been expanded by this much, you know, it was completely expanded. So I could write Craven in a completely different way than I would have written it had I never written Moonshadow. Um, and that's why I was so happy a couple of years ago when Dark Horse put out this beautiful hardcover edition. And now we're finally talking about getting a, a, a paperback edition of it out into the world as well. So uh, they did just a beautiful job. It, it's called the definitive edition and it really is. And it is uh, it is credited as being the first ever fully painted American comic book. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, John J. Muth was all of maybe 23 when we started working on that thing. And he was already brilliant, you know? Yeah, it's already, beautiful. Already brilliant. And he has only, he's only gotten uh, more brilliant as the years have passed. And it is interesting that you mentioned that uh, they're basically the same story, but, but on different, you know, in different levels, because I feel like that is something that, that is something that writers can really take a look at is like, what story can you tell and what kinds of filters can you put it through? Because exactly. then it's a different it's all story. About the filters. Yes. Yes. And yet the essence of what you're trying to communicate is the same, you know, uh, obviously with Brooklyn dreams, it was much more conscious. Here it is. I'm just telling you, this is what happened. Whereas with Moonshadow, I was doing exactly what the main character of Moonshadow was doing. I was probably halfway through that series or more. You know, we had it. We had this this narrator who was the main character as an old man, yeah, telling the story of his life. And I was taking him at at his word. I, as the writer, because it was like he was dictating the story to me, and I was trying to get down his story. And about maybe three quarters of the way through it, I realized this old guy's lying to me. This isn't how it happened. He's taking his own life and turning it into a fairy tale which is exactly what I was doing with my life. So there was this circle from me to him and him to me, if you know, if you know what I mean. That's interesting, yeah. 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 That's so my true. own narrator, I didn't know was doing exactly what I was doing. <laughs> I really believed him. Oh, this is what happened. Oh, this isn't what happened. You're kind of making this stuff up, you know? At one point I considered that we would find Moonshadow at the end, old Moonshadow in an insane asylum, you know? So that it, was, it was all just completely the ravings of a crazy old man. But we didn't, I didn't, I'm glad we didn't go that way. No, yeah, it would have been, uh, it would have put a completely different tone on the book. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why when we did the sequel, which was, I don't know, eight or ten years later, Farewell Moon Farewell Shadow, Shadow, we wanted a completely different tone. It wasn't the old man telling his tale. It was a different perspective on his tale on, and his life from there forward. And it did not have this, you know, the same sort of uh, whimsical, cosmic fairy tale feel to it. It had a very, very different feel. And um, felt more grounded. Sequel, yeah, yeah, more yeah. grounded, and yet, and yet, and yet not, yet more poetic in some mm. ways as well, you know what I mean? It was more, more fable than fairy tale, maybe? That would, that, yeah. that makes sense, yeah. You know, and I, I, I have to say, I, I think it's some of the best work uh, uh, Muth ever did, ever, that his illustrations for that, because a good part of it is just illustrated prose, you know? With little, with little comic sequences in between. And I think it's some of the best writing I've ever done. I'm really proud of that book, the sequel. Well, I will I'm say, the whole damn thing. I will say like, uh, when I think of John J. Muth, Moonshadow is the first thing I think of. Yeah, he's had a very incredibly successful career yeah. uh, writing and illustrating children's books. And if, if you have Apple TV, there's a kid's show on there called, I believe, I think it's called Stillwater, which is based on his series of, of Zen children's books that he's done. Um, and it's very successful, you know, winning awards left and right. He's an executive producer on the show. Um, it's hugely successful and well-deserved because he is uh, just a huge talent and, and remains a good friend as well. 
Do you think he's historically underrated in the annals of comic book history? Well, he hasn't done that much in comics. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the only reason. I mean, he actually worked with me on Silver Surfer for about six or seven issues. I remember And this. worked in a much more mainstream style and nailed that too. You know, he's so, so gifted. But he was from the moment I met him when he was in his early 20s. He was, he's, he's always been really good, right? Yeah. yeah just, he's just always had it. He's always, he's always had it. Yeah, it's just always like you always look at if somebody looks at a list of comic book painters, it's always kind of the same names. And John J. Muth is usually there, but he's usually probably lower than he should be. So oh, I don't think there's ever been any anybody better. And the fact that I got to work with him and then we followed it up with Blood of Tail, working with Kent Williams, who is also just so incredibly mm. brilliant. I've been very lucky in, in the artists that I've, I've, I've worked with over the years, incredibly work, lucky. And I always say, you know, comics, it's words and pictures. And if one element's not working, the other, I don't care how brilliant your story is, if the art element's not working, if you don't have that fusion between the two, the story's not going to work. That is interesting, though, because um, I remember reading Brooklyn Dreams and thinking, if you pulled out all of the text and just put it on, you know, on a page with no pictures, it would still work. It wouldn't work the same. It wouldn't work no. as well. But like you, you, you do tell a whole story there. Yeah, but but what Glenn Barr did on that book was, you know, that was one of the cases where I had this project, I brought it to, it ended up, it ended up at Paradox Press, what was originally called Piranha Press at DC. And it was a guy named Mark Nevelo who was running it. By the time we really got into print, Andy Helfer was running Paradox Press. But Mark Nevelo was, was running it. And I had an image in my head of how I saw this book visually. It's a little bit of Eisner in there, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that ability to kind of look at the past and exaggerate things because the memory is further back, things like that, how I wanted the streets of Brooklyn to look, things like that. And Mark Nevelo showed me, what do you think about this guy, this guy, Glenn Barr? And I look at the work and it's exactly what I was seeing in my head. You know, I mean, that never happens. You know, when does that happen? You know, that's like, this is all really, this is the images that I've been seeing in my head and there they are on, the, on this page. And so that, the, 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 one of the best compliments I ever got was a writer friend who said something to, I'm gonna mangle it, but I'll get to the essence. He said, I always thought that the best comics have to be done by someone who is both a writer and an artist, that that fusion, that they have complete control of the materials and that Brooklyn Dreams basically read like it was created by one mind, mm. that the fusion between writer and artist was such. Um, and that's a huge compliment, but Glenn, Glenn just did such an amazing job. He always gave me either exactly what I was seeing in my head or he made it something better. By any chance, was that person who said it Will Eisner? No. <laughs> no. It's, that, no that's that, something that he that says. That would have been a compliment. Yeah, oh, that's really? something that he says in one of his books. He said that oh, the, uh, all great comics must be, uh, the writer and the artist must be the same person. Interesting. Well, if you're Will Eisner, I understand why yeah. you feel that way. And, and there's uh, some truth to that. You know, if, if I could draw, I mean, really draw. You know, I spent most of my childhood drawing and I almost went to art school after high school, but I didn't. Um, if I could really draw, I don't think I'd ever want to do anything but comics. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, what a, if you can write and draw, what other medium would you want to work in? If you can do both those things, you can express yourself in ways that no other medium would allow you to express yourself. Absolutely. You know, so if you're John Byrne or Walt Simonson or Frank Miller or fill in the blank, you know, why would you want to do anything else? Larry Hama, I think, doesn't even write a script. I think he just draws straight onto the page because he knows oh, really? what he can do. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, well, he knows he's very talented. He really knows what he's doing. But I remember uh, reading that about uh, with Eisner and thinking, like, well, I felt like I felt offended on behalf of everyone who does collaborative comics. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, it's okay. Everybody, you know, everybody's got an opinion about this stuff, and for him, that opinion is absolutely correct because he's Will Eisner and he is the beautiful fusion of really great writing and great art and knowing exactly how to bring them together. But you know, if you're a writer in comics, you have to have the visual sense of an artist. You have to, you have to be able to see these stories. You know, sometimes even if I'm, if I'm working full script, sometimes what I will do is I'll only write the dialogue for the whole 22 page story or the dialogue, but I'll be seeing the pictures in my head the whole time. I'm watching the movie and writing the dialogue or I'll do the reverse. I'll just write the, all the visuals out. You have to be able to, to see these things, to be visual. Now, the artist is going to be able to take that and spin that in ways that I can't because I don't have their skill. 
but I'm a very, very visual person. And I see these stories. You have to see, you know, I work in animation. You have to be able to see this, yeah. this animated movie playing across the screen in your head while you're writing it. You have to think visually or, or you're in the wrong business. Um, we have mentioned, uh, we've mentioned Shrieking. We've mentioned Amazing Spider-Man over 400 with the death of Aunt May. And we've mentioned Moonshadow. You reference a particular Victorian novel or I guess it's smaller than a novel uh in all three stories and you did mention the author early on do you have a particular interest in uh, peter pan oh it's you know there are certain stories <laughs> that imprint on you at a very young age and a lot of them you know really more for me as a kid from the movies than from the books i, I went to the books later you know um and peter pan when I was a kid, well, there was the Disney Peter Pan, of course. Mm -hmm. And then there used to be this, uh, they would play it very, sometimes once a year with Mary Martin. It was like a live play, a live play version yeah. of Peter Pan. And, you know, when I look back at Peter Pan now, it's a funny thing because the main body of the story is not so much what interests me, what happens when they go to Neverland on the, on the island with Captain Hook. It's fun. The thing that always really got to me about Peter Pan was somebody shows up at your window and takes your hand and you fly away. You know, there's a scene in the Disney movie, you know, where they're flying over London. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of the most beautiful scenes, I think, in any movie. It's just, it's something so magical about that. You know, it's almost like they're being abducted by a UFO and Peter Pan is the UFO, you know? And then in the Mary Martin version, there's this wonderful scene at the end, which I don't remember if it's in the book or not, where, you know, Peter comes back. He wants to play with Wendy some more, except she's old. 20 years have passed. You know, she's old. She's probably like, you know, 40. <laughs> you know, she's got a kid. She's got a kid. And, you know, she's, got a, you know, she's got a 10 year old kid. It's not like she's a 90 year old woman, you know, but that it's also this it's, it's this sense of escape to something bigger and higher and more magical, you know, a spiritual escape. Um, but it's also that last scene is heartbreaking because it's about the passage of time and how Peter hasn't changed. But Wendy has and time goes by, you know, like that. Um, you know, my story, The Girl in the Bay, that I did a couple of years ago for Dark Horse. Uh, this woman uh, uh, is attacked, thrown into Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn and comes up out of the water. And it's 50 years later, you know, and that, yeah. I, that has to have come from my love of Peter Pan. Because that, uh, that, it's just the greatest metaphor for the passage of time, you know, because um, our lives feel like that. You know, um, when you're a kid, and I certainly am not the only person to say this, you know, when you're a kid and you're, you're like school would end in June and you stand there in June and you're looking ahead to like September when school starts, that's about maybe 5,000 years between June and September, you know, <laughs> that feeling when you're a kid, you know, I and have then eternity, but no, do, I don't. And it, and it feels like eternity. Yeah. And then you blink and it's 20 years later. And, and, and time just keeps compressing, compressing, compressing. And I think for me, you know, we, we go back to what we're talking about with spirituality, you know, a lot of the mystical traditions talk about the world as an illusion. And to me, time is the very definition of why the world is an illusion. It's just not real. It goes by, not, you know, Christmas just passed. You know, it's like, oh, Christmas is coming. Oh, it's good Christmas. Oh, Christmas is gone. Oh, it's another Christmas. Oh, 10, 10 more Christmases, you know? Time just flies by. There's a Bob Dylan line uh, from one of the songs on Blood on the Tracks. Um, where he says, time is a jet plane, moves too fast. And I always return to that, that line because it does. It's just yeah. like amazing. All, well, and, and Peter Pan, that metaphor at the end is perfect. But there are certain stories like that. You know, the Wizard of Oz, you know, that movie was on TV every year when I was a kid. You couldn't get a, 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 a cassette or a DVD or go to streaming to see it. You had to wait till they played it. I think it was every Easter they would play it. And there are certain images in there uh, like, you know, the giant head of the wizard on the wall when they have their when they have their meeting with the wizard for the first time. You'll see giant heads floating through a lot of my stories because there's something in that imagery that just imprinted on me in such profound ways. Um, and then, you know, later on, uh, it wasn't until I had kids myself that I started, that I read the Oz books with them and fell in love with that whole series and fell in love with Oz in a whole new way, you know? Um, and so, you know, things that imprint when we're little kids imprint in ways that stay with us forever. You know, the Twilight Zone is another thing. I was watching the Twilight Zone when I was like six years old. And, and, and it really, it helped define my view of the universe. It really, really did. Really? You know, you, yeah. Well, you know, well, here's, I've, I've talked about this before, but it's like, did it define my view? Or I think the things that we react to like that, 
I think we come into this life with a certain knowledge and belief and worldview. And we react to the art that awakens and reinforces that worldview. Do you believe there's a soul, you already have a soul that comes in that is prepared for certain things? Yeah, that has a, that there's a particular, there's a, there are certain truths that we, that are inherent that we're born with. And, you know, society around us can either like pour concrete over that or, or allow that to grow. And so I think about being a little kid watching the Twilight Zone, you know, watching these stories where it becomes clear that the world as we assume it to be is not what it really is, that the universe is almost like a living thing that we interact with, you know? And I reacted so profoundly to that and still love Twilight Zone to this day. I think it's the greatest TV show ever, as far as I'm concerned, you know? And, and I think I reacted to it in part, if not in large part, because there's a part of me that knew that, that believed that the universe was more than what I was being told. And this show reaffirmed it in my soul, you know, and yeah. reinforced it. Um, and, we, and we are, we get attracted. You know, when you read a book, you pick up a novel and something clicks. I think it's, it's clicking with something that you already know, but your conscious mind hasn't grappled with it yet. You know what I'm saying? And then That's suddenly you see, it, you see it put out on the page and you go, yeah, that's true. That's real. And it I think that's the fundamental, that, that, you know, I, I obsess with that because I think it's a fundamental question in our lives. Who are we and why are we here? It's really, really simple. If, if you don't address those primal questions in your life, how are you even living from my perspective? Now, I yeah. want to do whatever they want, obviously. <laughs> but from my perspective, it's like, you know, by the time I was like 16, 17 years old, I, as you saw in Brooklyn Dreams, I was obsessed with that. What? Why? What? what? You know, there's that great line in, um, you know, uh, in John Lennon's song, Instant Karma. Why in the world are we here? You know, it's yeah. really not to live in pain and fear. You know? uh, so why are we here? Why are we here? You know, and I was reading, you know, Sid Arthur when I was 16 and going, yeah, th th there's some answer there, but what is it? You know, um, and these are the fundamental questions. And whether you're asking those questions psychologically because there's the there's our our view of ourselves who we think we are versus who the world says we are versus who we really are there's just you know the whole question of identity both personal and cosmic is fascinating and it's it's the primal question in a lot of ways i does that ever does that ever frustrate you with with people sometimes because like the older i get for example the more i meet people who are just they're they're, they're kind of just skating through life they're like all right i'm gonna go to my job because that's what i'm supposed to be doing and then blah 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 is that you know, ever everyone you? Is, uh, i it probably would would have frustrated me when i was younger i think uh, uh thank god i i think i have a broader view of things now it's like you know live your life however you want to live your life i'm not going to tell you how to how to live your life i'm just sharing you know through a conversation or through my work my perspective what i've learned what i think this is all about you know um you know, I'll, I'll, I'll judge you if you're out there harming somebody, then I'll, then I'll, then I will have judgment. I'm not so evolved that I can sit back and have no judgment about that, you know? Um, but, you know, you want to, you know, you want to skate through life. Maybe that's fun to skate through life. I don't know. Sometimes I, you know, I, I've always been someone who's been a thinker, a warrior, you know, looking at the big questions. And so there are days, you know, I've said to my wife, I think I'm going to be shallow from now on. I don't want to think about these things, you know, but it doesn't work because it's not who I am. <laughs> you just so, can't, you know, yeah. You can't turn that can't, off. It's it's not in my nature. But you know, if you if someone has the ability to just have fun and skate through life, you know, skating is fun. Go ahead, skate. I'm not going to judge you for it. Yeah, it's actually uh, something that makes me a little envious. <laughs> but uh, but that is that is one of the things that I found fascinating because you know there are con there are multiple references to Peter Pan in your work and right. I'm like yeah, Peter yeah. Pan is the exact opposite of a coming of age story. Peter Pan specifically not himself Wendy yeah the or, character or the himself yeah. it's true it's the exact opposite he talk about arrested development you know and yet it's also that i guess a metaphor for that innocence that we want to hold on to you know and and you know that that whole that whole thing of you know if, if you do what i do for a living if you're involved in writing stories of fantasy and science fiction and all this kind of stuff you can't do that unless you still have the peter pan in your soul yeah you know, Absolutely. the good and the bad of childhood, because part of Peter Pan is those kids are sometimes not very nice, you know. No, they're terrible. Um, you know, they're doing some awful things to Captain Hook. He's not just the terrible, you know what I mean? There's a reason why he doesn't like him, yeah? Um, but you need to hold on to that sense of wonder uh, to do what we do. And frankly, I think you need to hold on to that sense of wonder to be alive. 
you know? Uh, yeah. uh, look at another one of my favorite writers, Ray Bradbury. And all of his work is just radiant with, with a child, not childish, a childlike sense of wonder. There's a real big difference between childish and childlike, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I love Bradbury so much. It's so, um, it, it, it connects, again, that thing, or is it connected to something that's already in there, this wonderful childlike sense of wonder. And, you know, the other thing I love about Bradbury is whenever I read Bradbury, it makes me want to get up and write because his writing is so filled with the joy of writing that it makes me want to write more. Um, also, does uh, your love of duality and your fascination with duality, do you think it was influenced in any way by the fact that the Mary Martin version of Peter Pan or even the Disney version of Peter Pan, Mr. Darling and Captain Hook are played by the same people? Oh. Oh, that's funny, but no, I don't think so. I, I think I just became aware at a, at an early age of that that the thing that that drove me crazy, that pulled me apart. Uh, and we again, we talk about picking up literature and recognizing something in literature. That's why when the first time I read Dostoevsky, it was like, bang! I know what this is about. This is about the war between the opposites in our souls and in the world, you know. And how how do we get beyond that? Can we get beyond that? Can we transcend that? Um, so I was just aware of that. That was just something that was just there at a young age. I looked around and I went, wow, th these opposites, you know, and can, can you ever find a balance between these kind of opposites? Because it feels like they're warring inside the soul, you know, and Dostoevsky was the master of that. Uh, do you want to say something to plug your uh, workshops? Um, let's see. Well, I'm, I'm not doing the workshops right now. Uh, things just have got busy. But one thing that, that I will mention that I do continue to do, if you go to my website and you go to story consultation, is I work one-on-one -on -one with writers. So, you know, right now I'm working with several people who are, they're working on their own mini series. I'm working on someone else who's working on a screenplay. Um, so it's one-on-one, -on -one. you send me the work, I go over it, we get on Skype, we talk about it, I give you notes, we help develop it. You know, it's really, really fun for me to work that way one-on-one -on -one with people. And, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. What I, and, and, and I think I know a little bit about story and it gives me, a lot of people were there to help me at the beginning of my career. So it's, it's really exciting for me to be working with writers one-on-one -on -one and, and helping them to make their story the best story it can possibly be. My job isn't to impose my story on theirs, but to help them to make the story that they want to tell the best it can be. So uh, I'm, always, I'm always up for doing more of that. It's really, really fun. And I will get back to the workshops at some point, uh, maybe later this year. Uh, but right now I don't have one scheduled. Do you ever work with anyone and like the story, for example, just might not be your cup of tea at all, but you can, but you can see why it's valuable and why this person- Yes, is absolutely. It's the same thing, you know, the same thing for me as a professional writer. Um, I was just talking to somebody about this. You know, sometimes you're handed a character and you need the gig. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not necessarily a character that you resonate with, but you have to find the value in that character. You have yeah. to find the thing in your connection to that character that excites you. I, I have yet to have somebody come to me with a story and for me to go, oh, I'm not working with you on that. That's what I, you know what I mean? Um, and the same thing, you know, 99 and nine tenths percent of the time. I mean, there may be some character out there that they would come to me with and I go, sorry, I, no, I'm sorry. I really don't want to write the adventures of Adolf Hitler. You know what I mean? I'm not going to do that. Uh, beyond that, though, you can always find something of value. And of course, you know, hey, we write comics. We write villains all the time. That's part of the game is talk about duality. You have to go inside your own soul and find those dark pits in order mm -hmm. to, to, to relate to those characters and make them three-dimensional and human. Yeah. Did you you, know? you, you have was... to find the light in those dark characters also in order to make them human. Yeah, I, that, that was always you because there were always four writers on the spider books and um, that was always you doing that. Like you, you, were, you would always uh, have, for example, you would give Carnage his, his tragic backstory and everything. Did I, did, I, did I give Carnage? I don't know if I gave, did I do that? I, I feel like, so. I feel like everybody was, you know, because it was a team effort, everybody was trying to do it, but you, you're, you, you're the one who really related it to family and and related it to Maybe. Shriek and the rest. and Oh, on that, that thing, the family yeah. element. Yeah, I think that's something we came up with as a group. I, I can't necessarily take credit for that. But that's, but that's something I do naturally anyway. It's true. I, I like writing the villains. I want to understand, you know, I don't know if we talked about this before, but it's a, in a weird way by writing these absolutely, you know, the, the quote, bad guys and getting into their heads and understanding them 
it becomes an exercise in compassion. It really does. Yeah. Because the minute you understand something, you can't hate it. Of course. You know? Yeah. So yes, uh, you have to oppose that thing and you have to stop it, uh, but you can oppose it without hating it. And then in a, in a weird way, it becomes an exercise that one can take out into the real world, you know, not just as a writer, but as a person, because if you can understand somebody, uh, uh, even if you're on completely opposite ends of the spectrum and you think that what they're doing is really harmful, at least if you can understand them in some way, you can bring some compassion to bear on that. You know, one of the things if we're, uh, in, in uh, the great Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, they go, they're about to go to war, but part of it is you have to go to war with detachment. You can't hate your enemy, you know, while you're going to war. And, and um, I remember there was an old quote from, from Ram Dass where he was talking about the 60s and all the protests. And he said, you have to love the people you're protesting against. Well, I'm not saying that's easy. No. But, you know, I always feel in life, a little, the littlest drop of compassion goes a long way. You know, the littlest drop yeah. of compassion. Goes a long way. Well, I, I feel that too with the current state of the world, right? Like, it's like, we're not going to change anyone's minds on the right by yelling at them. Like, no, and, and and no, no, we're not. You know, there's, there's a great story I heard years ago, and I'm going to get the details completely wrong, but it's a true story. And I've read several articles about it over the years. And it was these uh, these these neo-Nazis who were harassing, I, somewhere, I don't remember what city it was in, harassing this one particular a well-known rabbi, right? And I mean, they, they just, they did, not, treated him horribly. And again, I may get the details wrong, but the essence of the story is correct. And then one of these neo-Nazi guys, his health collapsed in some way. I forget what it was. Maybe he was in a wheelchair. He got very, very sick. All his friends abandoned him. And the one guy that stepped forward to help him and take care of him was this rabbi that they had been harassing all this time mm. and how that changed this person, you know? And you hear stories like that all the time. And in the end, you know, there are some people, they have a screw loose and you just know for this lifetime, it's not about um, reaching out with compassion because there's certain wiring in their brain that just isn't there. And I yeah. don't know if, you know, but for 99% of humanity, I think a little bit of understanding, a little bit of compassion. That's why I don't, I've never been a fan of groups of people. The minute you start putting us into groups, things start to get weird. And yet when people tend to relate one-on-one, -on -one, all the other stuff goes away and you can connect in ways that you can't, as soon as you identify with it, I'm a Democrat and he's a Republican. I'm left and he's right. I'm uh, Catholic and he's Protestant. I'm black and they're white or whatever the thing is, you know, that identification with group think, even with groups that agree with, you know, that old Groucho Mark line about, I would never, what is it? I'd never belong to a group that would have me as a member, you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, even groups that, that I am aligned with, I'm not, I've never been comfortable with groups. I like individual connection a lot more than I like group connection because I yeah. think it allows more for that, for that flow. Yeah, because groups always feel like if, if you do one thing that they, you know, they don't disagree, they, don't, they, they, they disagree with, it's like, well, you're right. out of the group now. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then the more people you put in the same room, the more, the more things tend to go haywire. You know, that's why I like it. One-on-one, -on -one. talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, you know. What's the main piece of advice you find yourself giving to writers? To writers? Yeah, when you're working with writers. Okay, so if I'm is there one the that just keeps popping up? Let me think. You know, I think the bottom line is, and I may have said this before too, is is it has to be profoundly personal. Mm. I always say, and kids, don't try this at home. I mean this metaphorically. You have to take a knife and plunge it into your chest and bleed on the pages. You know, metaphorically. Um, <laughs> But he said to stick a knife. No, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> you know, it has to, it, it, I don't care whether you're, you know, if you're writing what you're writing, if you're writing Spider-Man or if you're writing your autobiographical comic, it has to matter. It has to come from your heart. It has to, you know, I've been chasing this quote for years and I've changed so much, I now take credit for it. But years ago, I read somebody said something to this effect and I've looked everywhere and I cannot find the source of it. So I'll claim it. And it's, it's whatever you're writing, at that moment, try to try to fill it with 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 everything that you are, all your thoughts, all your feelings, all your concerns, all the themes that obsess you. Put that write that story as if you're never going to write another story again. 
And, you know, obviously not every story is going to be a container for everything you think and believe. And you're lucky when you get those stories that you can do that with. But you can pour yourself into any story, any story. Yeah. You know, when we were doing Justice League, haha, ha, funny Justice League, those characters were real to me because I was pouring myself into them and the people that I knew into them. And Keith was pouring his world into them, you know? You have to make it real. You have to make it authentic. It has to matter to you because, you you know, if a, you want the story to matter to the readers, too. And the way it's going to matter to the readers is if it matters to you. Which character in Justice League did you most identify with? <sighs> Not necessarily my favorite, but I most identify probably Beetle because he was like he was the he was the everyman in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah I know he was a, allegedly a genius inventor and all that stuff. But, you know, in our version, he was just. He was the guy in the middle and commenting on everything. You know, even Booster was from the future. So he had a little bit of a, a step back because he had that futuristic thing going in. So I related, uh, I absolutely related to Beetle. Yeah, and, 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 the whole, and Beetle and Booster together, they were like, you know, so many of my friends in the way that we interact and everything. Yeah. And uh, although, yeah, if I had to pick a favorite character it was probably be uh, Martian Manhunter. I just thought he was the greatest straight man ever. Yeah. you guys introduced the oreo thing that's right that's yeah. right yeah yeah i i thought that was that was interesting because when you guys came back to to justice league to with formerly known as the justice league mm -hmm. i actually found that funnier at the time but i'm like now i'm thinking did hum did my humor just change or did humor just change in general or you know what i mean like did i was, think that that um it was probably even whatever the humor was in the original series was even speeded up there, you know? Yes, that's what but it was. Those stories always felt to me like those old, you know, 30s movies with the real rat -a -tat -tat, his girl Friday, those movies where people are just talking back and forth and the funny lines are flying back and forth. And that's why I would sometimes would be filling up a page with 35 or 40 balloons and giving the letter a nervous breakdowns because it was just, uh, it was the rhythm. It was the rhythm of the interchanges, you know, bang, 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 bang. And I think there was even more of that when we came back to it. I've got a couple of last questions that I want to ask. I know we're my okay. full time. Um, uh, Justice League Unlimited. Uh, usually when people adapt a, a comic book adaptation, I don't think it's a comic book writer who does the adaptation. But what is it like? Um, what, may, what prompted the changes from Alan Moore's version of For the Man Who Has Everything? to your version of For the Man Who Has Everything. Oh, that's always a group decision. You know, yeah. when you're working in TV, you know, I don't come in and say, this is what the story is going to be. I'm sitting there. Uh, I used to basically get on the phone in those days with uh, Stan Berkowitz and Dwayne McDuffie, and they in turn were talking to Bruce Tim and James Tucker and everybody else. So we, you know, we, we'll, we, we decide together, or like when we were working on the Superman Red Sun animated film, you know, I was getting on the phone with Bruce Tim and Jim Krieg. Mm -hmm. How are we going to adapt this story? What are we going to do? What's going to what what will work in this form that doesn't work in that form? How do we narrow this thing which is so big down? So there's there's lots of decisions that go into that. Okay. Um, but I will say it was a lot of fun. We just finished it uh, at DC uh, Justice League Infinity, which is yeah basically the new season of Justice League Unlimited. I got to work uh, with James Tucker, who's just a great great guy and and, and an incredible uh, creative mind. And, and Ethan Beavers with his beautiful art and, and just, uh, just a great team, Nick, Nick Filardi on the colors. It was just so much fun. And we really treated it like it was the new, what, like it was the new season. As and if there I was a that, reunion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're back and here's the new season. And, it was, and, and I think we did a story that was significant and meaningful for those characters. And uh, I think the collected edition comes out in April or May. Right. And depending upon how that sells, we may come back and do another one after that. If ever there was a Justice League reunion, uh, you know, special or anything, you want to come back as one of the writers? Oh, absolutely. In a heartbeat, especially after having done this, this series, you know, yeah. it was like when you work with these characters for so long and so intimately, when you come like Ben or the Justice League there, it's like getting it's like if you haven't seen a friend for five years, or, you know what I mean? And yeah. suddenly, you know, these friends you haven't seen for five years, you all get together and you just pick up where you left off. And that's what it's like. You know, writing Ben is like a reunion with an old friend. It really, really is. So uh, with uh, yeah, with with uh, people like Steve Scrosi doing the covers, too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I have to I, I, and I have to, again, uh, um, credit David uh, Baldeon 
uh, and, and and Israel Silva, who's doing the the coloring. You're doing such a beautiful job with this book, such a beautiful job. And as good as the first issue looks, literally every issue looks better than the one before. Oh, because they get the rhythm. I just. Uh, yeah, exactly. You, you know, you get the rhythm. And I just saw that you know, they just wrapped up the fourth issue, the art on the fourth issue. And it's like light years ahead of the first issue. And the first issue was great. You know, so um, yeah, I, I've been very, very, it's just, it's just fun. It's a fun, it's fun to be, you know, you, you don't want these things to be a nostalgia trip and just a nostalgia trip. Because if that's what it is, it's not worth doing. You want to do something that deepens and expands the characters or with just a segue, we really move the story forward. Now, it's just so far we can move Ben's story forward because we know what comes after. Yeah. But we can deepen it. So if you can't go forward, let's dig down and go deeper. And that's what we're trying to do with this series. I feel like uh, anything that is just purely a nostalgia trip is doomed to fail because it's never yeah. going to be as good as people remember it in their heads. Right, right. And if you want to, if you want just a nostalgia trip, then hey, then read, go back and read the stories. They're all out there. I got a, a, a shelf full of, of giant collected editions, the, the Clone Saga, the Ben Riley stuff. It's all out there. Yeah. So, so you have to bring something fresh to the table. Yeah. Or I like, else it's not worth it. I like to say this is the actual real golden age of comics because everything is just available and it's yeah. easy to yeah. access everything. Yeah. Um, Everything except my two years of spectacular Spider-Man, and I want to see that collection. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is, uh, that is my favorite Goblin story. Your two years of spectacular Spider-Man. Oh, thank because, you. Yeah, I, it's one of my favorite stuff that I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah, because as good as all of the other Goblin stuff has been, I think that's the one that was the most tense, most most intense, uh, most personal. Yeah, uh, and uh, definitely ends like in the most touching way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks in no small part to Salvi Sema and the beautiful work that he did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. The only other thing I just want to say in 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 the coming year, I've got a lot of stuff that I can't really say what it is, but I've got five different creator-owned books happening, um, that will be coming out in different ways. Can't say what ways they are just yet. Um. um I've got a novella that will be coming out at some point this year. Um, and then, of course, we got Ben Riley and, and, and some other things on the horizon that I can't talk about. And so it's, it, I just sat down on my schedule the other day and I went, I might be booked through July. You know, <laughs> there's a lot, just a lot of fun, exciting, creative stuff. And a lot of it is original stuff. So that's always fun you know, to write it. It's original. so cool that you're still that you're still so active. That is so cool. You have to be. You have to be. You have to be because that's what am I going to do? You know, a, a, a few some maybe this is ten or fifteen years ago. I went through a phase where I was questioning whether I still wanted to be a writer, and I was and I, and I had to look at it very very seriously. And it was a very difficult thing to do because what we identify with what we do. Yeah. I'm a writer. I'm an artist. I'm a singer. I'm a dancer. I'm an accountant. Whatever the thing may be, you know. So I, I realized I was incredibly identified with my writer self. I said, like, do I still want to do this? And in order to even begin to understand that question, I had to separate myself from my writer self and kind of surrender it to the universe, you know? And what came back to me was, this is who you are. If I wasn't getting paid for this, I'd still be laying on the floor, staring into space, making up stories. So how lucky am I that I get to get paid to do the thing that I'd be doing anyway for free? You never thought of going into music full time or, or, or anything? You know, when I was younger, that was the thing I was into. And, and, you know, I played in bands for years and I still I still write songs. And I, you know, back in the 90s, I put out a CD and I, I've got about four albums worth of material that maybe when COVID is over, I'm going to finally get my ass back in the studio and put some new music out. But what I realized, and I didn't realize it consciously at first, I just made the switch from music. You know, I had this band that broke up and then the writing started coming along and I jumped onto the writing train. But I realized in retrospect, I do not have the nervous system for the musician's lifestyle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, life on the road might have killed me. I, you yeah. know, I, I just I don't have that personality. I don't have that nervous system. I have the nervous system for sitting in this room here and making up stories. I was made for that, for working at home, for being with my family. You know that that's the nervous system that I have. But like I said, I still love music. It's still in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm a musician first and a writer second in some strange way that would probably take me an hour to explain. 
but you know, like I said, I still write songs, I still sing, and I want to go back and, and get get my my friends together and go back into the studio and record these 800 songs that I've compiled, you know. Um, but I'm much more suited to this lifestyle than I would have ever been at on the road somewhere in some, you know, Holiday Inn in the middle of nowhere, playing, you know, 10 gigs a week, and and it would have been a disaster. <laughs> and you'd probably still be writing then too, wherever you were. Yeah. yeah. That's true. That's really true. Did, Just as I'm still doing music now, right? I would be writing then. Yeah. Do you ever uh, write with music on in the background? Like, do you ever do you write with playlists on? I can't. No, I can't. You know, um, what I find is that it, it distracts me. Mm -hmm. it, music with lyrics distracts me. If I I can do I, I, what I can do is I can work with sort of ambient music. Mm -hmm. very floaty celestial kind of stuff that doesn't intrude upon my consciousness um and sometimes i even have to shut that off it's like i just i am so i have to be so into this world on the screen here that i can't be distracted by anything when i'm editing the material i can listen to anything it's fine it's great you know you hear about people like i have to write i have to blast rock and roll you know and i have to have that music while i'm writing i can't do that it's just it's my brain my brain goes like this if that's happening. You know, I, I, I need quiet. You know, there are these, some of these things you can find on YouTube. They call it binaural beats. It's supposed to like get you into an alpha state or something. I don't know, but it's really nice floaty music. And sometimes I'll just put that on and let that float in the background while I'm working, you know? But I can't, I, you know, as much as I love the Beatles, I can't write and listen to the Beatles. You know, I just, I, I, can't, I can't listen to anything with lyrics that requires that level of engagement from my brain. This is uh, earlier when you were saying that uh, you pour your, you pour everything of yourself into a page. What I, I was going to think like, yeah, even if it's a biography, if you were to do a biography of John Lennon, it would still be the biography of John Lennon as told through the lens of J.M. DeMatteis. Well, that's true of any yeah. biography that you read. Yeah. I don't care how objective someone is trying to be. And, and the, the proof is in find one person, find one historical person and read three or four different biographies of them and see the different lenses that people place upon the same events and, and the interpretation of the same events. Um, you know, I've read Lennon biographies where he's a saint and others where he's a demon and others where he's something in between, you know, because it, so much of it is what the writer brings to bear. You know, the facts of someone's life can be interpreted so many ways that, uh, you know, so it's true of any, any creative act. And okay. it makes you wonder about, you know, the news that we're getting, you know? So as much as people try to be objective, there's always gonna be some kind of filter in the way that's presented. You know, all right, a bridge collapsed. Here's a picture of it. That we know, that's one thing. But how do you report that event? What's, you know, how do you tilt it this way or tilt it that way? We can't help it, we're human. We see things through these these lenses and these lenses, you know. Um, it's 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 fascinating. It's fascinating. I got one last question. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I do have to go. Uh, so I was interviewing one of your contemporaries. I won't name him who on the air, but I will tell you who it is once we go off. Um, okay. And this was right after we did our last interview, and uh, he said, and then I said that, oh yeah, I just finished an interview with you, and then. He said, oh, wow, he's a real writer. And I go, well, so are you. He goes, no, but he's a real writer, like real literary writer. Like, how do you feel about <laughs> your contemporary uh, saying that about you? That I'm, I'm complimented. I'm touched. Um, you know, what that really means in the end, what it means to me is that that's someone who respects my work. And that's that's a nice thing, whether I'm a real writer and this person is not, I don't buy that. Um, but, 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 but that's a really sweet thing, especially from someone who is a contemporary. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, All right. Great. We is, can do I, this. These, these conversations, we always get, in, this is the second time and we get into some interesting spaces here that don't usually come up. So I appreciate that. It, they're fascinating to me. So. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. It's good to talk to you. Thank you very much.